This is the Sales Babble Podcast, episode 197, Never Be Closing, The Key to Better Sales, an interview with Tim Herson. Welcome to Sales Babble, the podcast that shares selling secrets for non-sellers. And now your host, Pat Helmers. Happy New Year. Hello, sales babblers. This is Pat Helmers. And today I'd like to talk about the second most difficult task of a sale. It's to ask for the business. Closing a prospect is a monumental challenge for many sales professionals. But maybe you're looking at it all wrong. Tim Herson is the author of the book, Never Be Closing. And in this episode, Tim shares a process where prospects close themselves without any arm twisting or sketchy wordplay trickery. Take your closing skills to the mastery level. So, with no further ado, let's get to it. Welcome, Tim. Are you ready to babble? I'm ready to babble. Tim, you are the author of the book, uh, Never Be Closing, How to Sell Better Without Screwing Your Clients, Your Colleagues, or Yourself. That's it. <laughs> I'm a co-author, actually. I have an, uh, a, a colleague who, is, who wrote the book with me whose name is also Tim. His name is Tim Dunn, and uh, he operates out of Europe. And, uh, but we've been friends a long time, and we've been colleagues a long time, and we've learned a lot from each other. And I think that's really what the genesis of the book was, is what we learned uh, from each other, from each other. You were recommended to me from Dave Isley. I don't know if you know Dave, but he's the author of the book Phyology. I do know Dave. He said, Pat, you have got to get this guy on your podcast. Sweet of him. Good man. Good man. Because I have this notion of what I call the no close close. Mm -hmm. Oh, so we're in sync already. Right. So I only have people on here who already I already agree with. So which is which is bad. No, that's not all true. <laughs> you don't always fight. You should always fight. Right? <laughs> that's not all true. A clash of ideas. Actually, you know what's interesting? It's a clash of ideas, not a clash of personalities. I think that's also a really important principle. It is a good thing, particularly, you know, in in today's environment where we see so much polarization. People are actually in a sense, they they don't have a clash of ideas. They have a clash of personalities. And wouldn't it be better if we argued, if we, you know, established uh, the ideas that we're coming from and argued about those things as opposed to I'm right, you're wrong. Oh, I, t- I, I totally agree. I see it this way, you see it that way. People commonly listen to agree or to deny. Yeah. No, they, don't, they don't commonly listen with non-judgment. You know, to see where maybe there's commonality, maybe there isn't. Let's not be too quick to jump. I like, it's interesting, I like what you said here. It's it's really a class of personalities, not ideas. Yeah, it's really interesting. And in an odd way, although this is <laughs> really entirely unrehearsed, that is one of the, the bases of, of the thinking that's that's in the book. You know, we call it never be, be closing. And, and, and frankly, that was not the name that Tim nor I wanted to use. We, we were initially a little bit uncomfortable with it, although the premise of not going into a sales conversation with the idea that you're going to close is a really important one. You know, there is not a sophisticated human being on earth, and by sophisticated, I mean somebody past the, I don't know, grade level seven, who doesn't know that they're being closed. And everybody knows <laughs> how it feels, you know, when you know somebody is trying to close you. You don't feel warm. You don't feel good. You don't feel valued. You feel like a thing. You feel like an object. And, and nobody remembers you for closing them, <laughs> right? unless maybe sometimes negatively. But what they do remember you for is they remember you for being useful. They remember you for being helpful. They remember you for, for listening. And it's those things that ultimately are the key, I think, to a relationship. And then in turn, a relationship is the key to being able to help somebody and, and, and ultimately, possibly, but not always, making a business deal of some kind. Yeah. In your book, you say, I'm going to quote you here, it says, the Tims, I'll quote the Tims, that a stranger doesn't have the leverage of instant credibility. So it's not surprising that a wide range of sale tactics, tools, closing techniques have been developed as a substitute 
for credibility. And their purpose is often to wrangle out a commitment to buy, even when buying may not be in the best interest of the client. Yeah. So that's exactly right. And, you know, and, and one of the things that that implies, of course, is that it takes a little time not to be a stranger. You know, it, it, takes, it takes work. It takes effort. It takes authenticity not to be a stranger. And that fights, clearly. I mean, there's, you know, there's no argument here. That fights in the face of so many of the be more productive mantras that we hear, you know. Be more productive. Hit your numbers. Uh, you know, do the call in seven minutes. <laughs> do the call in six minutes. Whatever it happens to be. I don't think you make friends in six minutes. Right. Like I don't think you establish credibility in six minutes. Right. I think a lot of this stuff is kind of glo- is uh, bogus. Is the idea you got a ten exit? <laughs> yeah. You know yeah. that it's a numbers game. I think that's a yeah. bad myth. You know yeah. that you have to work. You need to work smarter, not harder. I'm not certain what that even means. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In that an ABC. Always yeah. be closing. Always be. Always be. That's uh, from uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn, Glenn Ross. Ross. You know, everybody knows that movie, right? <laughs> and, and it's, you know, that movie is a caricature. Clearly, the play and the movie are caricatures, no question. But there's, unfortunately, a lot of truth in it and that there is such a, you know, there is such a pressure to sell. There is a pressure to be productive. And yet, I think ultimately it is probably not where you want to go. One of the things that Tim and I say in, in the book and when we do seminars, when we talk to the folks, is we say that we ask people, you know, what's the purpose of the sales call? And almost everybody, whether they're professional salespeople or not, they'll say, well, it's to make the sale. And we say, no, it's not. It's to make the next sale. And that's a really key distinction, because if you're thinking about the, the next sale and the sale after that and the sale after that, what are you talking about? You're talking about a relationship. And once you start talking about a relationship, once you start talking about genuinely being there for somebody, whole different world, whole different world. The other thing that people often talk about is, is they, they, they equate sales calls on a, you know, or they measure sales calls on a binary scale. I did or I didn't. I failed or I succeeded. It was a yes or it was a no. I closed or I didn't close. But that binary approach to a sales call, that binary approach to anything is actually self-defeating. Uh, you can't even learn anything if you have a binary approach to something. One of the things that we like to say is that there's no sales call that's not a success. Why? Because you're learning. You're learning every single time you do it. You find out what's working, what's not working. How could I listen better? How could I express myself better? How could I be more empathetic? How could I describe whatever it is I have to describe better? So the, every call, every call is an opportunity for success. doesn't mean you're going to make the sale but it's an opportunity for a success of some kind. And I think that's critical. So how do we close people then? <laughs> so it is a, a great question because one of the reasons we didn't like the original title that, you know, the publisher suggested of never be closing was, you know, it, first of all, it's got a negative in it. And, and secondly, it, 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 even though it's a negative, it puts so much of the focus on, on that close. And ultimately I think two things happen. One is, and it's the rarer of the two, I'll admit, is you don't have to close people because they'll close themselves. They will recognize that the discussion has gone in a way that is useful to them. They'll usually ask questions like, how much is it going to cost or when can you deliver it and so on and so forth. And these are not what I call buying signals. These are different things. Some people call them buying signals. These are things that simply establish that you have begun to meet a need or address a need that somebody has. So that's number one, is people close themselves, doesn't happen as much, obviously. But the other one is really simple. What more do you need to know before we get to business? What more do you need to know before we sign the contract? Is there anything else you need to know? That's all you have to say. And that's the simplest close of all. And it's most also in a sense, it's the most honest close of all. What more do you need to know before we move ahead? And they'll tell you, and if there's a lot they need to know, great, work with that. And if not, they'll usually say, well, you know, no, I'm, I'd like to start. You know, what's, what's involved in starting? Now you're in conversation number two. 
So I don't think that closing is a function of trying to trick somebody. <laughs> I think closing is just a function of trying to recognize when you've, you're starting to travel down the same road, that you're starting to be in agreement with each other. That's all it's about. So you ask, what more do you need to know? And the prospect goes, eh, nothing. Nothing. Any other thoughts, questions? No, I think you did a pretty good job, Tim. Then what happens? So you're at, so what would I do? Right. If 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 the um, the project involves um, a, a sign of some kind, uh, we say, great. Can we talk? We, can we start looking at the paperwork? And if they don't need to know anything, fine. If they do, it'll come out in the paperwork anyway. Or if it's one of those sales that doesn't have to do with uh, or doesn't require a particular piece of paper, say, okay, well, when what's a good date for us to get started? Let's say I'm in a consulting mode. Let's say I'm selling a sales training program. The next step would probably be for me to say, great, I'd like to meet with uh, some of the people that you're interested in training. I'd like to get to know where they're at so I know where to start. I don't want to go over old territory with them. And let's set a date. So, and, and it'll vary, of course. There are as many next questions as there are, obviously, relationships. But all you really have to do is, is you know, it's, it's all about, I use the word authentic, and the word authentic <laughs> has become an inauthentic <laughs> word. You know, like it's, like, it's just really ironic. But, you know, what would you what would you what would you do with a with a, with your friend? What would you do with with, you know, with with someone that really meant something to you? You just go to the next step, whatever that next step step happens to be. And I am not saying and I and, and I and I wouldn't want to be misinterpreted, you know, that you walk away from every business negotiation or or sales deal with a new friend. I think that's kind of Pollyanna ish. I have worked with lots of people who I get along with really well on one level, but I probably wouldn't want. We talked about your name earlier. You know, Pat's the guy you go out and have a beer with, who I probably wouldn't want to go out and have a beer with. A lot of them. It doesn't mean, though, that we, just because we're not best friends, that we can't have a friendly relationship and we can't work within the confines of whatever that context is that we work together in. So I'm not saying that everybody becomes your best friend. What I am saying is, and it comes right back to that first quote that you talked about, is that you don't have to be a stranger anymore. Right? It's, it's really pretty, pretty simple. I really like this. Because what I, what I hear you saying is, is that if you have properly like shared what the value of this is, and you've like had a genuine conversation, and, you, and you're not really going for this this binary yes or no, that you're just slowly kind of explaining what this is and you're keep asking them, do they understand this? Do they see this? That they're going to close themselves because they're going to see, if they don't close themselves, it's almost like it's on you, right? That you've not really shared, you've not properly shared how this is going to benefit their lives. Well, I think so, in a sense. You know, I would be a fool to think that every single person that I meet is an appropriate market for yeah. what I have to offer. <laughs> right. Like, That's exactly right. <laughs> like, Not everybody's qualified for your stuff. <laughs> exactly. But if there is a connection, but if we can find those intersection points, then we have something to talk about. I have gone away, in fact, from, you know, we talked about being friends earlier, you know. I've gone away from sales calls that were, that didn't result in a sale, but actually did result in a friendship. Now, that's a cool thing, you know, to have somebody that suddenly becomes, wow, I would like to have a beer with this guy. And maybe, you know, two years or three years or even five years down the road, we decide that there's a business deal in it. But that wasn't the yeah. purpose of yeah, I've, I've had I've had a, I've had two or three people here on Sales Babble who have that exact point of view that um, even if you don't get business out of them, you might you might get a referral out of them. And if you just Absolutely. keep and yeah. they may not be exactly the right client for you, but they might know somebody who is. Yeah. 
Well, you know, we talk about this thing in, in the book. Uh, we, we talk about being useful, and we use the, the acronym of, um, uh, of U-S-E. And um, the, 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 um, the, the, the S stands for, for, you know, I don't want to go to the whole thing because we've only got a few minutes to go. But the S stands for sourcing. And one of the things that we say that, that we can do, that anybody can do, is you can walk out of a sales meeting. I talked about success earlier, you know, having the success of learning. But you can walk out of a sales meeting having given success to both parties by referring that person that you're speaking to, to somebody else, not necessarily a competitor of yours, but somebody else who might be of value to them. And I had a specific experience with regard to this. I was working, as you mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm from Canada, and I had a specific experience. Um, uh, a, a guy that I was talking with was part of a, a project that was opening a branch in Quebec. And the, 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 the call did not end in a successful sale. But what I was able to do within the context of the call and then follow up later by email is I was able to refer that person to a translation service in Quebec. Uh, there was no money exchanged. There was absolutely no tangible benefit. But one of the things that we had talked about was that the French that's spoken in Quebec is different from the French that's in France. And I know that very well. And in yep, fact, the French yep, yep, yep. In, in Quebec, they can kind of get a little offended when people come to them with materials that are obviously French French and not Quebec French. So I was able to make this referral. I made two people happy. I made him happy. And I made the guy that I made the referral to, who's a, an outstanding translator, has an outstanding service, made him happy. So I actually made two nodal connections in the context of that call, although I did not close the sale. And those connections have reaped reward over and over and over again, although I never sold ever to either of them. How interesting. How interesting. So there's a, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. All I'm going to say is it's, so this sourcing, you know, one of the things that you can do to, to demonstrate your usefulness to somebody is refer them to someone else who can help them. And I'm not necessarily talking about a competitor, although maybe that too, but I know something that can help you right? or somebody that can help you. Yep. I think that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. To, it's the best way you're going to leverage your network. That's in fact, Absolutely. you know, and in fact, that's how you and I bumped into it. Yeah, Dave recommended that I, you know, that I meet you, but I just, I just reached out to you on uh, on LinkedIn. That is right. That is right. <laughs> and you and said you were in Europe, I think, actually, at the time. <laughs> that was Say a while what? ago, actually. Yeah. Oh, it was because it took us a while to find a mutual. Uh, yeah. A mutual time that we can. You're an important we, person. Oh, no, I'm so important. You have no idea how important I am. <laughs> oh, my God. There are people all over the place. They love me. You know, in any regards, you know, so, so something else I wanted to bring up, too, is that what you're talking about in this conversation is what we used to call advancing the sale, right? That every time you talk to somebody, every or every, that you're constantly just moving the sale on a little bit. You weren't expecting it to immediately for them to say, I, I'm going to buy. They just, you just keep moving it in a positive momentum, and you just keep moving it a little bit farther. Advance it, advance it, advance it. Yeah. Well, and, and I, would, I, I think the answer to that is yes, but I would modify it slightly, and I would say that it's also an exploration. You know, it's also it, – you can't advance without learning. You can't, I mean, if you take the military uh, analogy, you know, that you're advancing into you know, new territory, you've got to have your scouts. You've got to know what the terrain is like. You've got to know what's over the next rise. You've got to know if the, if the ground that you're walking on is solid or muddy. You've got to know all those things. And in order to know those things, you have to learn. And that's one of the reasons that the whole questioning process and, you know, anybody worth their salt in sales knows that questions are more important than answers. Um, that's what the questioning process is about. It's not only to steer somebody in a particular direction. It's so that you know more and that you can begin to understand what it is that this person needs or what it is that this person fears or what it is that, it, that is, you know, a, a frustration for this person. 
It's, it's the knowledge aspect, the human and factual knowledge that you can gain through that relationship. So what's something our listeners can do this week to take action on this? <laughs> Great question. So uh, the most important thing that I've discovered that you can do to help your sales process has very little to do with the sale itself. In fact, it's <laughs> after the sale. And it's a little, a little mnemonic that I use. It's called GPS. It's a super simple system. And what it is, it's a way of learning from experience. It's a way of looking back at that last sales call and starting to evaluate what went right, what went wrong, and what I could do better. GPS stands for good or great, the G. The P stands for poor or problematic. And the S stands for step ups. So you take a look at that sales call that you've made, whether it's by phone, whether it's in person, however you've conducted it. And you say, what was great? What did I do that was really great? And you start listing the things that you did and you try to be exhaustive. So you don't just list the first thing. Is there a second thing? Is there a third thing? What are the things that were great or perhaps good that I did? Then you take a look and you say, well, what were the things that I did that were somewhat problematic? What was poor? You know, I didn't listen well enough. I interrupted the guy just as he was getting to to his uh, you, you know main point or, or main concern. Um, I stumbled, you know, and my presentation was, was, was stumbly, you know, whatever it was. And you list all of those things down. So now you're taking a look at this thing, both from the positive and the, from the problematic side. And then you do the step ups and you go through each item on your list and you say, well, what could I do to step that up? What could I do to ask better questions? What could I do to listen more carefully? How might I do those things? Then you go to the poor or the problematic and you say, well, how could I you know, stop doing that? Or how could I, you know, reverse what I did there? Or how could I stop that habit that I, you know, that I tend to do? And now you basically have an action list, you have a to do list. And the to do list usually is, you know, what do I have to stop doing? You know, you got to stop blabbing, Tim, you're just talking too much. What do I have to start doing that I'm not doing already? I have to listen better. I have to take notes better. Again, whatever it happens to be. And what do I have to keep doing and just, you know, do it better, work on it better? If you do that after every single sales call, you are going to become a really good salesperson. If you do that after every time you play golf, you're going to become a better golfer. If you do that every time, you know, you order wine at dinner, you're going to be a better wine orderer. It's learning from experience. So the most important thing that we can do is that process review, that GPS process review. But here's what usually happens, Pat, is that people don't do process reviews. They do follow-up, but it's all content follow-up. It's all, you know, when's the next call I have to make? What should I be saying, you know, in this instance? Who else should I meet? All of that's important stuff. But we forget about the process. I love it. GPS, good, GPS. poor step-ups. You got it. And so easy. I used to do this sales manager and I would sit in and watch my folks. I'd sit in the back of the room. And at the end, you know, after we shook hands and everybody left and we went, we went back, back to the parking lot, I'd start walking through this list. <laughs> the same yeah. thing. Yep. That was a power. It was a very powerful way of getting across what worked, what didn't work. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be confrontational. You know, as a sales manager, you know that there's a there's a power dynamic. But if you do it in an open way and if it's not just you who says, here's what was good, here's what was poor. If you actually make it into a conversation with the people who are reporting to you. Yep. Say, hey, hey, Bob, you know, what do you think was great that you did in, in that meeting? What, what what really stood out for you? He'll tell you. And you say, hey, Bob, so what you know, what didn't work the way you thought it might work? You know, well. Where did the slips occur? He'll tell you. And now you have a conversation. Right. And it doesn't have to be, I know more than you. It doesn't have to be a power thing. It's a way yep. of learning from experience. Yep, yep, yep. I totally agree. Yeah. I totally so that's agree. what people can do. You know, Think about your last sales call. Do a GPS. Apply the GPS to your next sales call. See what happens. Excellent. Your book's on Amazon, right? It is indeed. And, and where, where else can people find you online? 
there's uh, timherson.com. That's my uh, website. I uh, also do a lot of posting on LinkedIn. I, I do these little aphorisms. You know, they're literally just one-liners. Uh, stuff that I've learned over the years, and people tend to pick them up and, and get something out of them. Um, you know, one of the things, just to give you an example, I often talk about, uh, uh, you know, one of the things I work with is, is innovation and, and problem solving. And so one of the things I say, one of my little aphorisms is uh, uh, th- that it's easy to get caught in the great uh, the great answer, wrong question syndrome. And that's when you come up with a fabulous answer, either to your own issue or in the sales context to your client's issue. It's a great answer you came up with, but you're asking the wrong question. So it isn't going to do anybody any good unless you ask the right question. The best answer in the world to the wrong question isn't going to help you. So those kind of little aphorisms. Uh, and I'm on LinkedIn uh, as Tim Herson, and I post usually one a day. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Tim, thank you very much for visiting us here on Sales Babble. And, hey, Pat. Uh, fun to babble to, with you. We're going to close this, this interview now. <laughs> no, we're not. It's a good no-close close. A no-close close. close. <laughs> Actually, we want to open, not close. We do indeed. <laughs> At the very beginning of this episode, I said that closing is the second most difficult task in a sale. Most likely you've been wondering, well, what's the first? Well, it's getting the appointment. (laughs) That's the hardest part, right? When you're cold calling and you're speaking with somebody that you don't know about and you try to get them on the phone. If you can't get into a conversation with them, you can't close them. That's the most difficult. But this is the second most part. And because of this, we have covered this topic quite a few times here on Sales Babble. To get a copy of the show notes for this episode, you would go to www.salesbabble.com slash 197. And at the bottom of that post are links to past episodes on how to close a deal, how to ask for the sale. While you're on the website, don't hesitate to sign up and to get on the email list because every week I send you links to this so you don't even have to go to the website. It's just... Click on the link, and it'll and the episode will start playing. And I also share the show notes link, so it's easy peasy to keep on top of all of our guests here on Sales Babble. Got a question? Got a comment? Click on Babble Me or send me an email. I would love to hear your thoughts and things that we can do to improve the podcast. Thank you for listening to us babble here today. Hey, I really appreciate it. Please share this with your friends. It would really make my day. Until next week, take care and have a highly successful selling day. Thank you for listening to the Sales Babble podcast. Find us at www.salesbabble.com.